In this short video, we're going to learn about some properties of the definite integral. The first property we're going to learn about is going to be related to the geometric interpretation of the definite integral. We could also get this from the definition of the definite integral as well. If we have the definite integral of a constant function over a b, then that's just going to evaluate to being k times in parentheses b minus a. Now, geometrically, if we have a constant function, its graph is a horizontal line. And so the area between that horizontal line and the x-axis between a and b is going to be a rectangle. And the height of the rectangle is going to be the function value, or that constant value, and the width of the rectangle is going to be the difference between the bounds of integration. So in this case, I'm finding the integral of the function f of x equals 2 from 1 to 4. So that would just be the area of this rectangle whose height is 2 and whose base is 4 minus 1, which is 3. So its value will be 2 times 3 equals 6. Note that this makes sense even if we have a negative constant. Remember the definite integral then is going to be a negative number, so I'll take that negative constant times the length of the base of this rectangle, which would be 4 minus a negative 2, which makes 4 plus 2, which is 6. And so we get a negative number for the answer, which is what we want. The remaining properties I'm going to break up into four groups. The first group has to do with properties related to the bounds of integration. The second group are algebraic properties. The third group are properties where you can compare the value of the definite integral to some other value. And the last group is uh, properties dealing with symmetry either reflective symmetry or line symmetry or rotational symmetry. So without going through the entire definition, the thing that we want to keep in mind is our, our definition of delta x, which is b minus a over n. And maybe we could think about x sub i, which is a plus i times delta x. So properties involving the bounds. If your upper bound and the lower, lower bound are the same, then the value of the integral is zero. That seems to make sense to a lot of people. It really says that our delta x is always going to be zero, no matter how many, you know, no, no matter what the value of n is. And so in the limit, it's going to be zero as well. If you have a number c, which is between a and b, then I can take the integral from a to b, f of x dx, and break it up at that number c and write it as the sum of two integrals. And this should make a lot of sense. If I think of the integral from 0 to 3 of this function here, uh, anywhere between 0 and 3, I could draw another vertical line. So I drew a vertical line at 1, and I could break up that area into two pieces and then represent each one of those pieces with its own definite integral. And if I add those pieces together, I'll get the whole piece. So if I add the two integrals together, I'll get the whole integral. And then finally, it actually makes sense um, if we have the lower bound being uh, greater than the upper bound when we're performing 
and integration. And the impact of doing that is it just simply changes the sign. If you think about it, all we're doing is we're going to have a, a delta x value, which is going to be always uh, negative rather than always being positive. So uh, my delta x here would be a minus b over n, whereas my delta x here is b minus a over n. So swapping the bounds of integration simply changes the sign. And there are many times when we want to be able to do that. So for our algebraic properties, we have a constant multiplier rule, just like we did with derivatives. If c is a constant, then the definite integral of c times f of x dx from a to b is just the definite integral of just f of x dx from a to b, then multiplied times c. And we have an addition rule. So if you take the definite integral of the sum of f and g, that's going to be the integral of f plus the integral of g. And likewise, we have a subtraction rule that if you have the definite integral of f minus g, that would be the definite integral of f minus the definite integral of g. So in words, we would say that you can factor out a constant multiplier from an integral. We could say that the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals and the integral of a difference is the difference of the integrals. For our comparison property, properties, if we know that we have a function which is greater than or equal to zero between a and b, uh, then the value of the definite integral from a to b of that function has to be greater than or equal to zero. And as a direct result of that, uh, if f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, then the definite integral of f has to be greater than or equal to the definite integral of g with the same bounds of integration. And finally, if my function is bounded between two numbers, so lowercase m and uppercase m are respectively the lower bound and the upper bound for f. So the graph of f of x is between those two numbers. Um, then I can say really from uh, property two here that the integral of the constant function y equals m must be uh, smaller than the integral of f of x dx, and the integral of f of x dx must be smaller than the integral of the function y equals uppercase m dx. So the value of the definite integral of f has to be between the value of the definite integral of those two constant functions. But we know from our very first property how to evaluate the definite integral of a constant function. It's just going to be the constant times b minus a. So we can be even more specific about the value of the function if we know it's between these two numbers on a and b. And if f is a continuous function, then we know that uh, from the extreme value theorem that it must have an absolute max and an absolute min on the closed interval a, b. And so for continuous functions, we can always find a lowercase m and an uppercase m, which uh, satisfies this inequality. And our last group is symmetry properties. So this has to do with function symmetry. If f is an even function, remember even means that its graph has line symmetry, it's symmetric 
with respect to the y-axis, then if I'm finding the integral from negative a to a of f of x dx, so the bounds are very important here. You have to have negative a and then positive a. Then you can just evaluate that by taking the integral from 0 to a and multiplying it by 2. I think a, uh, a picture is going to be important here, but uh, it is crucial that these bounds are opposites of each other. So let's look at a picture. Here I have an, the graph of an even function. It is even, you can see, because it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And if I'm going to evaluate the definite integral from negative 2 to 2 of f of x dx, then the area to the left of the y-axis and between the graph and the x-axis is going to be the exact same area uh, between the graph of the function and the x-axis on the right-hand side. So I could just write the value of the integral as the area to the right of the y-axis multiplied by 2. On the other hand, if we have an odd function, remember odd functions, their graphs are symmetric with respect to the origin. They have rotational symmetry. And in fact, we already saw an example in a previous video uh, of this. But again, I need to have what? Opposites in my bounds, negative a to positive a, and its value then is going to be zero. We looked at this with the sine function, and we said, oh yeah, that's because the area below the x-axis is the same as the area above the x-axis. The one that's below counts as negative, the one that's above counts as positive. Since they're the same, they will add to make zero. I'm going to make another video to work out some uh, examples, so stand by for that video.